going to look at the other ism that is very strong in this country, humanism. And my text is found in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 18. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. If the only people who did any good in this world were the Christians, the world would be in a sorry state. I admit that quite freely. That if I got up here and dared to say from this pulpit that Christians are the only people who do any good, then I should be a liar. It's just not true. And one of the things that is constantly being thrown at us when we preach Christ is this. Do you think you have a monopoly of goodness? Can't you see that there are hundreds of people who never worship your God, never darken the doors of your church, and yet who do wonderful good, and without whose help and whose service life would be very much poorer? And indeed people say to a minister, you know, when I was in trouble it wasn't the Christians who helped me out of it, it was so-and-so or so-and-so. I've spent some of this afternoon with a doctor. I don't know whether he goes to church, I think not. And yet I marveled as I watched him with a patient and saw the selfless service and the attention with which he looked after a person in deep need. Now you don't need to be a Christian to do that. There are many people who are not Christians who are doing a great deal of good. And if I had only preached on hedonism, you might have gone away with the wrong impression that I thought that everybody in this community was living for pleasure and nothing else. This is obviously not true. Indeed, there are very few people I meet who are wholly given to that. All of us have a hedonistic streak in us. All of us have a streak in us that wants to enjoy oneself. But I would be the last to say that everybody or even the majority are living by that faith alone. Most of us are mixtures of hedonism and humanism. Most of us have a better side as well as a worse side. Most of us find ourselves doing wrong things and right things. Indeed, Paul talks about those who by nature do the right thing. And this is certainly true. Now, I want to look further at this other ism, which does make the world a very much better place than it might be. Scouts have been mentioned. Behind the scout movement lies a very great deal of humanistic belief and practice. Let me distinguish it from two things to make it quite clear that you understand what I am meaning by that word. People debate what it does mean, but I'll tell you what I mean by it. First of all, let me contrast it with last Sunday night. If a hedonist is someone who lives for himself, a humanist may be defined as someone who lives for others. If a hedonist in the simplest terms is a person who says, I am going to get as much out of life as possible, then a humanist, in simplest terms, will say, I am going to try and put as much into life as possible. And you will see that we are <coughs> a strange mixture of the two. Mr. Watts mentioned that in his testimony, though again I didn't know what he was going to say. With the enjoy oneself side and make oneself comfortable side, also went the do-gooding side. The scouts, many other things. Now there are many people who show this strange mixture in different proportions and I would think that the average Britisher worships at both shrines and indeed combines both isms somewhere in them. So that we may say the hedonist is very much more selfish than the humanist and there are many humanists who are devoted to trying to solve and relieve some of the problems of our human race who would never admit to being called Christian, who would certainly never bother to worship God, but who are making this world a much sweeter place than other, otherwise it would be. The Oxford English Dictionary defines humanism as a devotion to human interests. In other words, seeking to help other people. Now if you put these two together, is it not true that most people in our land are a mixture? And while they are hoping to enjoy themselves, are also quite ready to devote themselves to a human interest where the need is obvious and great. What my job to do tonight is, is this. It is to show you that neither hedonism nor humanism is Christianity. And if we can think our way clearly through this and see that a person does not need to be a Christian to do good, that a lot of good in the world is done by non-Christians, then we shall get our thinking straight. 
we shall not say of such a person that was a Christian thing to do. Nor shall we suggest that the Christians are the only ones that do good. We shall think straight and see that to be a good humanist is not to be a Christian and alas sometimes to be a Christian is not to be a good humanist. Let me on the other hand distinguish it from another rather long word and then I'm finished with long words for tonight. Humanism is often confused with what is called humanitarianism which is quite different. Humanism is concerned with a belief, humanitarianism with a behavior. Humanism is how we think about this, humanitarianism is what we do about it. And while every Christian must be a humanitarian according to the word of God and do something about the needs of men, no Christian ought to be a humanist in his beliefs. The difference is this, a humanist believes that you may leave God out. A humanist creed can be stated quite simply, you've heard the Christian creed tonight. The humanist creed says, I believe in men, almighty. I believe that this human race has the capacity to meet its own needs and to solve its own problems and that we ought to dedicate ourselves to this. To talk of God is a waste of time, it's irrelevant, it's out of date, it's old fashioned. What we need to do is to get on and help people. Now there is someone who came to this church for about two months, a year or so ago. They have now given up worship and do not go to any church. Instead, they have taken up humanism and are devoting themselves to social welfare. And all the time that was spent in church is now spent in social welfare. And that person is a very good illustration of the creed of humanism. And that person is quite sure that they are doing as much good and indeed more by devoting themselves to men as they, they ever were when they tried to seek God. Now you see the difference. A humanist is someone who says there's a need. The world is not what it ought to be. I'm going to devote myself to trying to put a little corner of it right. But I can do that without God. I don't need to go to church to be like this. I don't need to think of him to do this. I don't need to be religious or Christian in order to help my fellow men. It has its hymns, some of which alas have found their way into our hymn book. I'll not name them and then it won't spo be spoiled for you if ever another preacher chooses them. It also has its poems. What's that man, Abu Ben somebody, woke one night in a deep, deep peace. You remember that? And finally came to the astonishing conclusion that the heart of religion was to do to others what you wanted them to do to you. Well, that was said in the Bible long before Abu Ben, what's his name, thought of it. Christ did say this. But the important thing was this, that Christ constantly said, be or think of God before you think of men. The first commandment is not thou shalt love thy neighbor, the first is God, then love your neighbor. He only said do unto others after he had said do unto God. And this distinguishes his view from all humanism. Now let's look at some of the forms of this religion. There are two forms at least. I'm going to give them labels that are original. I hope they won't confuse and so far as I know they are not the normal labels but for purposes of my thinking I've always distinguished between what I would call automatic humanism and energetic humanism. The automatic humanism was the view that man had stepped onto an escalator, that mankind was going up and up and up and one day would step off the top into utopia, that it was going to happen that the human race had started on a progressive path. It all started with, of course, Charles Darwin. And he said, man has started there and he's come all the way up. And men began to ask, well, then why shouldn't it continue? Why shouldn't man still go on, progressing, evolving, becoming more and more wonderful? And indeed, the belief captured the minds of many men that automatically man would solve his own problems. And so religion could be left behind as one of those primitive superstitions that the early race needed but without which we could safely progress now. The automatic version was held by many politicians in this country. An English Prime Minister of not so long ago held it firmly. He said up and up and up and on and on and on. Grand eloquence. But we now know that it is not true. There are very few humanists who believe that automatically it's going to be all right that we are getting better and better, as one great humanist has put it, better and better in every way, every day. 
this is just not true. Two world wars have blasted this idea. We've realized what man is capable of and again we remember that next Sunday morning we shall remember those who have been slaughtered by man to try and find utopia. And he would be a bold man who would say that the world of 1963 is happier than the world of 1913, only 50 years ago. And that we are better and better every day in every way. The automatic humanism has gone. And in its place is an energetic humanism which says it's not going to happen automatically. We must bend our whole wills and energy to make it happen. We believe that man can land us there. We believe that utopia is waiting for us, that we can establish a kingdom of brotherhood and peace. But it'll take an awful lot of energy. It'll take an awful lot of effort. And we must do this. Now, in the energetic outlook of humanism, there are four particular things that seem to be the answer. First of all, there are those who seek in politics the humanistic energy and effort that is going to solve our problems. Now, with the deepest respect for such, I admire those who go into what is a dirty business in many senses, but no more dirty than many another calling, <coughs> and go into it and slave long hours and are often caught between the party and the constituency and who labor long and earnestly and give of their time and energy because they believe that in this way mankind's problem will be solved. That if they can just hit upon the right program or the right policy and then establish it, that we shall wake up one morning and find ourselves free from the tensions and the difficulties of life. That's one way. Then there is the modern fairy godmother science. And there are many who feel that because science has done so much, it can do it all. I have met them. I used to discuss many hours in Cambridge with those scientists who felt we can do so much, we can do everything. And who said, I believe in science almighty. And this was their creed. And it was amazing to find how devoted a man can be to this creed. Now let me not belittle science. How could I? Let me take just two examples of what it has done for us in the sphere of medicine and in the sphere of communication. I, for one, am profoundly glad that science has made the discoveries it has in medicine. And that as soon as we are ill, instead of 70 or 80 years ago, when you might have in Chalf and St. Peter been, of so, been so far from a doctor you couldn't get any help, now immediately there is an injection available within five, ten minutes. And the situation can be eased. We use this and we value it, or take the realm of communications, so that I can talk to a relative the other side of the world and they can talk to me, so that I can travel anywhere in less than a day, so that I can be here one day and there the next, so that the whole world may get to know each other. It is marvelous what science has done and is doing in communications. And the result is we have been dazzled into believing that because science has solved this problem and that, it can solve it all. And there are humanists who are devoted to believing that science has the answer and that religion is a back number. A third form of this humanism is to believe in education. I was in a court not so long ago. I was there as a friend of the prisoner and to speak for him, or not the prisoner, but the, the man who was in court and charged with a crime. And I was talking to the lawyer afterwards, the lawyer for the defense. And as we talked together, I said, you must get very disillusioned with human nature because it was not a very nice crime and it was a day on which they had a series of not very nice crimes. And I said, you must get very disillusioned. He said, I do. I think there's not much hope for, for this generation. Well, I said, what's your answer? What do you think is going to be the solution to it all? And he said, education. You can do nothing with these older folk, but if you could just get the younger generation and teach them that it's silly to do these things, that it's wrong to do these things, if we could only teach the young and educate them, that's my answer, he said. Now, again, I'm not going to belittle education. I'm glad that my children can go and get it. But if education is the answer, then students ought to be the holiest people on earth. Having lived among them for six years, I know that this is just not true. You can educate and depending on what sort of material you have, you either create a clever saint or a clever devil. Education can be used both ways, it's a double-edged sword. And while it can do a great deal to remove ignorance, it cannot solve the problem. 
the final answer that has become much more popular in the last ten years is the answer not of politics or science or education but quite simply welfare the teaching that we are here to meet the needs if we can't solve the problems at least we can reduce the effects of them and the growth of such movements as voluntary service overseas which has been featured in the national paper the last week or two which is not a Christian organization but a humanitarian one freedom from hunger world refugee year this is the new direction and it could blind us again into thinking that we can solve our problems by setting up such funds and organizations again far be it from me as a Christian preacher to decry these things they are good and right but I say in the name of God they are quite inadequate and can never solve the problem indeed there is an awful danger in this spate of humanistic thinking that Christians will be dragged the same way and distracted from the real gospel we have to preach you see the world can see no point in what we do except in so far as we do it in politics in science in education or in welfare and therefore we are tempted in order to be thought highly of by the world outside to throw our lot into these things and the church becomes a political agent or an educational one or simply a welfare organization now if we have no more to do for the world than offer them these four things as Christians well then we have no real answer and indeed those who feel that those four things can provide the answer need to think again I want now to turn and you must have wondered where I was going tonight I want to turn to three things that the Bible says about man which color a Christian's thinking and control his whole attitude to these things and after I've given you these three things which are to be found in the Bible about our human race I am then going to go back to the humanism and say now what does the Christian see there and seek to get a Christian attitude to the do-gooders and there are many of them and thank God there are first of all then what does the Bible say it's a vital thing to ask what God thinks about the human race not what we do there are three things here they are the Bible teaches the dignity of men the destiny of men and the depravity of men and you can never come to a right attitude to doing good unless you believe firmly and clearly those three things first of all the dignity of men that's why I read Psalm 8 what is men here's the answer of a prominent scientist he is an accidental coincidence on a minor speck of stellar dust that's you and me that's the scientific view in these whirling worlds in space way on one little tiny speck of interstellar dust some atoms have somehow come together and there's a man but the Bible view of man is this what is man that thou art mindful of him thou hast made him a little lower than God far above all the animals man is not to be measured by his size he is measured by something else a baby is more important than Mount Everest from the Bible's point of view in size there's no comparison but in value and dignity there is every comparison the human being is of infinite worth and value this is the dignity placed upon the human race by God in the Word of God we are also given authority in the Word of God as men to subdue and use everything that God has made for our purposes I have little patience it may be what little science I've dabbled in but I have little patience with those obscurantist Christians who think that every new invention is anti-God as if every new discovery is is against God's will as if man discovering how to burst the atom is not what God intended as if man's explorations into space are are not what God intended I am quite sure they are for when God made man he said now there I've made everything else for you to use for you to conquer and subdue and use it and therefore man has the dignity of being in a position to conquer and control everything that God has made that's why I can believe in science as a Christian I think God intended this but the one thing that science can't do is to tell us how to control ourselves it was God's will that we should control everything else 
but not his will that we should control ourselves and we have never shown a capacity to do this nor will we ever do so the dignity of man is that he is above all that God has made but he's below God that's his place the second thing the Bible tells us is that the destiny of man must be thought of in terms other than this life if I can use an illustration which may seem a little naive but gets my point across this life to men is just what the first stage of a rocket is to the rocket it is a temporary thing that will fall away we shall all come to the point where this body which has just given us a boost on the first stage will drop off if I can press the metaphor a little further the Bible teaches that there is an orbit for men and that this life is just a boost into it and that there is an eternity in which we find our true destiny and therefore unless you take account of life after death you will never be able to get a fair view of men if death is the end then you haven't a big enough view and you will never be able to solve man's deepest problems indeed there will come a point where humanism can do no more there comes a, do a point where the doctor facing a failing body can do no more and his work is over and the first stage of that person's pilgrimage is being dropped off it's finished with and the humanist is left behind the Bible goes further and says that life afterwards is the main life the main purpose this life is though it's important is of secondary importance you certainly couldn't enter the next but through this but this is quite secondary to that and this is what gives us our true view of men the third thing that the Bible teaches which is the most difficult to believe is the depravity of our human race I mean by that that every one of us has a twisted nature and that we were born like this and that we shall never be capable of being good of ourselves I shall come back to this in a moment but this is the rock on which all political schemes founder this is the rock on which all educational programs come and stack this is the rock in which all welfare ultimately fails what do I mean by the depravity I mean exactly what Jesus said what the psalmist said what Paul says but take the words of Jesus to make quite sure that you realize he said it no one is good no one now Jesus said that I wonder if you really believe it no one is good but surely says someone people do all sorts of good things that's a different thing to do good is not to be good if only we could understand this if only we could really see that when the Bible says you're a sinner it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing bad it means you are bad and Jesus is able to believe both things perfectly listen our Lord once said if you then being evil know how to give good presents to your children he admitted freely that people do good things but he said they are evil and it is this this amazing insight which we would never have guessed in any other way because to all appearances people are a mixture of good and bad but to God's sight we are bad if somebody says then how on earth can we do good things I'll answer that in just a moment but the biblical view of man is that man is evil and able to do good things but that fundamentally in himself and this is problem number one in the human race the problem is not how to control my environment how to educate my children or how to invent new capacities the problem is me it is straightening out the twist that is the biggest problem in life because I am depraved that's the word that the psalmist used as you noticed <coughs> and so with these three insights into the dignity of men able to control everything that God has made and deliberately intended to do so the destiny of man heading for something much larger than this life and much longer and thirdly the depravity that means we are evil even if we do good we look back at humanism and there are three things now to close with that I will say about all the good that is done in the world three things that a Christian says about those many people bless them who do a lot of good in Charles and Peter but who wouldn't come and worship God tonight the doctors the nurses the welfare workers the Red Cross the St. John's ambulance we could go through them all these people who are dedicating themselves perhaps even as I speak to helping mankind in its need what do we say about this well we say first of all it is indispensable 
that we couldn't do without it that the world would be a dreadful place if they didn't do it but as I began if it were left to the Christians we should not have the world that we have now let us say this quite freely we rejoice in it where possible we share in it and Christians are not out of these things they're in them and though it's almost as hard we'll say now to be a Christian doctor as a Christian politician there are Christians in both seeking to do the will of God there we rejoice in that and we share in it good is achieved and the world is a better place to live in because of these people secondly not only is all that good work indispensable it is inspired who are we going to credit with this and this is the point at which I part company with a lot of do-gooders who say that the credit should go to the people who've done it whereas we would say it goes to God and that if it were, it were not for God they wouldn't do it and this is the point at which I answer this objection how are evil people able to do good the answer is God's spirit is striving with them and if God were not in this world if God were not bothering with us they wouldn't do it for by themselves they are incapable of it and when you become a Christian the nearer you come to God the more you realize that there's nothing good in yourself at all and that if you've done any good at all it's been his spirit through you and this is as true of unbelievers as of, of believers anything that's good is to be credited to God let men see this and glorify our Father which is in heaven and not us or themselves the tragedy is that so many people do not give glory to God for this and when it is suggested that a person who has done a lot of good in this world may not be going to heaven after all they say but look they did that surely they have earned their place surely they're good enough instead of saying that God did that for them God did it through them and the Bible clearly teaches that of ourselves we can do nothing good at all but that God goes on inspiring the human race to do these things to stop it being altogether rotten and by his spirit we see people doing good who don't acknowledge him now if that is the truth then you can see that no man can stand before God because he's done a good thing no man will ever be able to say God you ought to let me in because I did this that and the other every man if he's truthful will say God you made me do that you gave me the grace to do that you inspired me to do that it is to see everything that is good in the human race as belonging to and coming from God and everything that is bad belonging to and coming from ourselves now I don't think until you're a Christian you can believe this until you're a Christian you still think there's a bit of good in yourself and that you have actually done some good things but when you become a Christian you say with Paul I can see now that in me there is no good thing I can see that if God had never bothered with me I should never have done a good turn in my life so that even a boy scout who is doing his good deed every day he wouldn't bother to do that if God had left this world alone it is indispensable but secondly I say the Christian says of all do-gooding it is inspired and when God leaves you alone will you go on doing it the answer is no when God withdraws his spirit from the world will people go on doing this will there still be a freedom from hunger campaign will there still be doctors the answer is no because God's spirit has inspired all this if there is anything good in the world at all it comes from above when will we learn this when will we stop bowing God out and thinking that men can do it all? I remember Dr. Sangster telling a wonderful story about a South Sea island where they worshipped the moon. Not the sun, but the moon. And when the explorers reached the island and found that they were moon worshippers, they said, why do you worship the moon? And the islanders replied, because you see the sun, though it's a bigger light, it only shines during the day when we don't need it but the moon shines at night when there's no other light and so they said we'll worship the moon and poor ignorant people they didn't know that every scrap of light that came to them from the moon came from the sun that they ignored now look can't you, can't you see that this is the cardinal error of all humanism it says I believe in men look at the good he does and they don't know that every bit of good they receive from men is a reflection of the God they ignore and if he was not doing it they wouldn't have any of it that's the difference between a Christian and a humanist not in saying nobody does any good but in saying that's from God not you and we give glory to the person who really is responsible for it 
And so I come thirdly to my final point. A Christian says to the humanist, your view is inadequate. It is indispensable, yes. It is inspired by God, yes. But it is quite inadequate. There are at least four facts that you ignore. The first is the fact of death, which is the greatest fact of life. And to the humanist, this represents the ultimate frustration. Why should it be that a man of great gifts and great qualities, helping others, should be stric stricken down with death? Why? Humanist has no answer to this one. Or put it this way, if you do not believe in anything after death, death means that you lose sight of the individual and the individual becomes a servant of a larger system. Because, you see, you then say that the individual is not an end in, its, in himself, but he is only a cog in the machine that is producing the perfect system. The individual comes and goes. It is the system that lasts. Death is the great fact which the humanist cannot come to terms with. The second fact is the fact I've been mentioning all along, the fact of sin. The humanist cannot see this. The humanist must always identify the evil in the world with someone else and say, well, it's due to the capitalist. We must get rid of all capitalists, then the evil will have gone. A Scotsman will say it's due to the people in Westminster. And if only we can get rid of them and get home rule, then we shall solve our problems. And the man with the dark skin says if only we could get the man with the white skin off our backs, that would solve our problems. He's the evil. Whereas the Christian, knowing the depravity of the human nature that is in him, says, I'm the problem with the world, and until this is put right, I can hardly begin to put anything else right. He begins with a fact of sin in himself. He doesn't try to say that man's causing the evil, or that woman's the cause of it all. He says, I am. I've got the trouble within my heart and soul. Let's look at some of those other things. Politics. Is it not true that every time politics found us on this rock, that human nature can't sustain the ideal system without getting over political? Can I just point out, there were two systems that we've tried in this country recently, broadly speaking. We tried to tackle the problem of production with the system of capitalism and laissez-faire. And we certainly produced the goods. The trouble was that human nature wouldn't share them when they came. And the few became rich and the many became poor. So we tackled the problem from the other end, the problem of distribution, and said we're going to have a welfare state and share it all out. And Archbishop Temple begged the, those who pioneered the welfare state in this country to remember that man was a sinner. And said, do you think human nature is above abusing this? The idea was all right that man, if he controlled his own industry, would work harder than ever, that if you only nationalized the industries, you'd have a tremendous increase in energy and devoted service. It assumed that if you made medicine free to all those who needed it, that no one would ask for more than they needed. It assumed too much. Much of it founded and is still foundering on the rock of human nature. So we've now gone back to the other, and the gap between the rich and the poor is widening rapidly since 1959. And so we're seeing again that human nature is not above abusing any system it's under. That's where all political systems will founder. Science found us on the same rock because science can say, and I've been in the laboratory where Rutherford worked to split the atom and discover the untold power. Do you know why he did it? He did it so that man should be free and man should be wealthy and man should enjoy unlimited power so that he should be freer to give himself to higher things. That's why he did it. And the first thing that atomic energy was ever used for was Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's human nature against sin. And education, I've already suggested, you can educate a man, you can make him more and more clever, you can give him more and more knowledge, but how's he going to use it? And even welfare, you may meet all his needs. But when you've finished meeting all those needs, is he a better man? You're still going to be up against the fact that in very few cases will he even say thank you. And those of you who were there when we read David Grenfell's letter will remember that remark in it. And the few... Very few say thank you, feeding 10,000 people a week. The fact of sin. Thirdly, humanists ignore the fact of God. God who made us, and we say, God, we don't need you, goodbye. 
We can manage on our own. We can have our women's voluntary service and we can have our Red Cross. We can have our voluntary service overseas. We can have our Peace Corps. We can do it all without you, thank you. We can help each other until we all meet each other's needs. Mind you, if that's possible, it seems to land us all back in hedonism again. For when all the needs are met, what do we do then but enjoy ourselves? No, the whole thing breaks down. God intended us for something much bigger than that. Much, much bigger. Without God, we shall never understand why we're here. Without God, we shall never be able to get there. God's power and purpose cannot be denied. If we do it, we ignore him at our peril. But my last word must be this. And if this sermon has seemed a little remote from the gospel, this is the point at which I bring it right back. The biggest fact that the humanist ignores as he seeks to do good to his fellow men without reference to God is the fact of the cross. Because it is there that humanism is shown up in all its utter weakness. If you look again at those three languages above the cross, Greek, Latin and Hebrew, Greek, the greatest culture that the human race has ever managed to achieve. Latin, the greatest system of administration and justice on which our law is still based to a large degree. And Hebrew, the highest religion the world had seen to that moment. And it was those things that were there on the cross. And it is at the cross that the human race in all its sin and in all its rebellion against its maker is stripped bare and we are seen as we really are and we see that politics and culture and science and education and schemes for welfare have done nothing to alter the beastliness that is in us I want to say that man's biggest need tonight is guilt and how to deal with it that's the biggest need it is coming out in play after play in novel after novel the world is desperately trying to find the answer to the sense of guilt we have. We look at a film of Hiroshima and we feel guilty that our race ever did it. We don't know how to deal with that sense of guilt. Indeed, I could prove this to you by the number of ways in which men are trying to find their way out of their guilt. Existentialism, blessed word, do you know it? It's a way out of guilt. And it's a way out of guilt by suggesting that really there are no moral standards, that we just live, that we are victims of our circumstances, that we must just exist from day to day within the situation we are in and not ask what is morally right or morally wrong. How significant it is that this started in France and came to fruition in France after the war when the German occupation had demoralized a whole nation and when sabotage and killing was right and when no longer had they any absolute reference of right and wrong and the writings of people like Jean-Paul Sartre have spread this view man is not guilty he is just a plaything of his own existence there is no right or wrong in life only weariness this is the message which our young people have adopted if you want to know the secret behind the beatniks then you've got it in existentialism it's a way out of guilt another way out is the psychological way and say a person isn't responsible their mother slapped them once too often when they were five years old. There is somehow a sickness here, not a guilt. And there are others who are desperately trying to assuage the guilt of our race by throwing themselves into this do-gooding, by throwing themselves into duty. Let me tell you a simple child's story. There was a father went away for ten days and left his boy with his mother and said, Now look, lad, Here's a piece of wood and a block, a block of wood and a hammer and some nails and every day you're a bad boy, I want your mother to knock a nail in that piece of wood. And every day you're a good boy, she can pull one out and I'll see what there is when I get back. And for five days he got five nails in. And the sixth day he realized what was happening and was terribly good and got a nail out and the seventh and the eighth and by the tenth day he got them all out and wiped his brow with relief. But his father came home and said, where's the block of wood? And there in the block of woods were five ugly black holes. We cannot atone for our guilt by doing good. There's nothing can get rid of those nail holes except the nail prints in the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is at the cross that the greatest need of mankind is met. The need of our guilt. There is not one of us could stand in this pulpit tonight and say I have not added to the problems of the world. 
There is not one of us could stand up and say, I'm free from the evil that is causing our race such suffering. There is not one of us who could say, I've never been selfish, I've never hurt another, I've never caused another grief. There's not one of us. And though we may have done good by the grace of God, that may have pulled a nail out, but it hasn't moved the nail out. And the guilt remains. That's where we say humanism fails most radically. Because if the humanist is, is right, the cross was a ghastly blunder and did nothing to meet the need of a human race. Whereas if God is right in his word, this was the one thing that our race needed to put it right. It is at the cross that the humanist ends and the Christian begins. It is there that our race is condemned and stands guilty, lost and helpless. And it's there that a new race begins, a new humanity, of people who've had their nature straightened, of people who've been made upright, of people who've been forgiven. And if someone says this is a slow way to put the world right, then I answer it is a sure way, for it is the only way. When will the humanists learn that you cannot put the world right until you put men right? When will that gospel break through? Well, it won't unless we preach it. Let us pray. O oh God, the creator of all men, who has created us for thyself and for eternity, not just time, we thank thee that thy Holy Spirit has not left us alone. We thank thee that the human race is not left to itself and we praise thee for everyone who is doing good in the world. We acknowledge that this is thy doing and we praise thee for it. But now we pray that even those who do good as well as those who do evil may be led to see their need of thee and their need of a saviour. We pray that that deepest need of our human heart to be rid of the guilt of our past and to know the power of thy spirit to do those better things in the future. That every one of us may come to that need in such a way that we shall realise our need of a power greater than our own and of thyself. We pray that anything that has been said tonight that has challenged and searched and has been of thee may be remembered and applied. And to thee we shall give the glory through him who became man for us men and our salvation who went about doing good and yet was made sin by sinful men and turned out of his own world and put on a cross and crucified. Even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.